Hello, welcome to the Revolver Fan First podcast. I'm your host, Christina Rowett, and joining me today is Thomas Harker of Meshuga, drama, lyricist, wizard, wizard of heavy metal, if you will. Welcome. I sure looked the part. Well, it's, you know, you're embracing it. You're, in, you're embracing um, your mystical yeah. elements. Your mystical I elements. I guess. You There's so much been. about me that is so mystical to me that I'm tr- still trying to figure it out. Aren't we all? You know? I guess, I guess. Yeah. So um, we always do the same question first, which is, who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? Uh, th- that would have been Neil Peart, probably, of Rush, the drummer of Rush. I started listening to them at, at a pretty early age. I was probably um, around like 10 or 11. And, and uh, Morton, our guitarist of the band, was actually kind of the one who introduced me to Rush or vice versa. And uh, and. Uh, he stayed with me for like, and he's still, he's still up there. You know, he, he meant so much to me as a drummer. And, and also he, in my teens, he was the one that kind of let me understand that you don't have to be the vocalist to write the lyrics. And, and he was the main lyricist for Rush for all the, all, all throughout their career. And, and, uh, and that kind of did something to me when I was like 15, 16, mm-hmm. which was by the time I realized that he was also the lyricist. And I, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and I was already kind of reading books in English and stuff like that. My English was shit, absolutely. And it was pretty bad for the first few albums too. Going back, it's like ridiculous. But anyways, you get better at it, I guess, you know, slowly but surely. Mm. Well, he's, you know, I, my, a friend of mine was a big Rush fan. He said, Neil Pert walks alone. He is, he's, he does. he's an island. He is a, a very special character. How do you find a band like that in Sweden at that particular time? So what, it's like the early 80s? Yeah, this would have been the early 80s. I mean, but yeah. I don't know, Pro- Prague and like the, the, that kind of Prague of that era, like bands like Yes and Early Genesis and stuff like that, was, they definitely had a following here and, and, and early Marillion stuff. Uh, so, so we kind of grew up a lot with that. And I, I actually, that was more kind of the side of things before, before metal that I listened to more than say, uh, like Led Zeppelin or anything like that. I completely missed Led Zeppelin. None of my buddies were listening to that. So that's like, a something that I, I, I realized and recognized that at, at a, you know, later stage in life that, holy shit, this drummer can fucking play. You know? <laughs> uh, so so that was like a later kind of thing for me uh, to appreciating that but yeah they were pro- yeah. Was, that, yeah that stuff was going pretty strong it felt like yeah uh, yeah you're a prog nerd you know if you will yeah. how did you dress how did you express your musical tastes as a teenager and stuff oh my goodness very badly i would yeah. say i mean looking back at it now it's like oh my god did we dress like that i i remember i used to have a pair uh i had a pair of jeans that that were so bleached out that they would constantly break and i would just constantly put new patches on them and i and my mom got so because she had to stitch most of them on there and at some point she just plain refused and i started just doing like using textile glue and just gluing them on and at and before i threw them away i think it had like 230 patches on them so they would literally stand on their own, you know. Uh, but, you know, I see pictures of that now. It's like, oh, it's not a good look, man. But then again, I mean, that, that was just kind of the what people were wearing, you know, at our school and, and, and when I was like 15 years old. And the girls weren't, you know, looking back at it, they weren't necessarily dressing too hot either. So. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it's not it's not a it's not a fashion that stood the test of time, if you will. You know. No. Did you have big hair? A big what? Did you have big hair? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of did. I mean, it wasn't that long, and it was like kind of short bangs, but it was all like so. So think like early Anthrax, and you have it. You spot on, like like uh, a Joey Belladonna type hair, you know, a little, you know, kind of the mullet going where it's like shorter up here because my mom wouldn't let me have the the full on long hair. Uh, so, yeah, but you can save it out in the neck if you want. So I, I walked around with kind of a mullet, like a curly mullet there for a That's few cool. years. Yeah. It was a <laughs> battle look, jackets, man. battle jackets and like the Reeboks and stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and that was that was still like it 
early like days of Meshuga, if you look at early pictures of us in the band, it was like full on just Reebok stuff and like, oh my goodness. It's, and, it was, yeah. look, it's a great, uh, look, I love to see it on um, 21 year old boys who weren't born when the style came around the first time. I find it hilarious that they've just taken yeah. it on board. It's like this, this little moment in time sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I wish if this wasn't if this wasn't a webcam that's attached to my actual screen here, I would point it to actually like an old picture up here that's got us all dressed in that kind of gear. And it's like the first picture I think we took with the band after I joined them. So the picture is from like 1990. It's hilarious. Maybe you could take could you take a picture of it and send it to your um publicist and we'll put it on screen? Yeah, sure. Later? I can do that. Yeah, because that would be pretty yeah. great. I think um all right. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So what was the first um, musical storyline you really connected with? Uh, I, I mean, Rush. what does that mean? Yeah. What well, does that mean? I don't know, like a, like a lyrical story of, of a record that you just went, like, I love this. I'm really into this I, thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, really, I did start, like, kind of reading and getting into the lyrics of, of bands like Rush, and I tried to understand Marillion, which was very cryptic kind of, you know, uh, very extremely poetic kind of, it's more like reading poetry than anything else really. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, but I, I don't know, man, as far as it was, it would be like a few songs, man. I didn't, I didn't like read everything through a whole album and try to like connect the dots or understand whether this <laughs> is like kind of a theme or what's going on. I, w I wasn't like that, that took a while. And I, I would say probably like, like Operation Mind Crime or something like that, we where where you had like where it's really like a theme, you know, where it's like a thematic album all the way through, and so it kind of actually has a storyline that kind of goes through it. So hmm. that would be the one that kind of really caught my attention. And 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 for for what it was at that time, it was I mean simply amazing. I still love that album, you know. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. it's good to it's good to connect eventually and and find your you know find yeah. your yeah. Yeah, I mean, at, I mean, at this point, for for what we do, we do we do spend a lot of time on on like the lyric side of things, and mm. not not just about what we're writing, but how you place the lyrics with the music, because that has to all, also kind of gel mm. uh, in a sense that that I I know we had one track of the new album that's called um, God He Sees in Mirrors, and and it earlier on it was a completely different lyric with a different name and it just didn't match what the music turned out to be and it did it's like it felt like it was really clashing like mm. no these lyrics are not not for this song and and uh, so I completely kind of wrote the lyrics for the track more than ha using something that was already done you know mm. to kind of get the right kind of vibe for for the music so there's there's definitely a lot of time and, and effort spent on those that side of things with mm. our band and it's not just about the music it's it's about the, the lyrics and 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 the rhythm aspect of the lyrics as well mm. Because you try you try to put them on there as as simple and and as straightforward as possible, uh, as far as like kind of to to kind of further drive the 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 song and kind of uh, make you feel the four four like the ground beat. But obviously, with this music that we that we write that has so much like accents and stuff and kind of over the bar line rhythm things that are going it's not quite that easy so so it usually takes a bit of time to kind of get that all you know, like to feel yeah. like effortless or, or feel like it fits you know well how how are things going with the new the new album obviously you put out a new song and all that sort of stuff what's what's the story there is it all done yeah i mean the album has been done for for uh -huh. a while now uh we we did uh, kind of deliver it to the label way later than we were supposed to. Our, our first deadline was uh, July 1st, and I think we delivered it like October of 21. So uh, we were like four months late, um, but but it's been done for, for a good while. And now we're just kind of waiting for the release, which is in like two weeks from now. It's exciting. April first. Yeah. Yeah. It, it always is, you know, because even though, I mean, we get pointers now, we did release a video, we did release uh, two tracks and 
and people seem stoked about it so far. So hmm. um, but we'll, we'll just have to wait to the after the first and see how people feel about the whole album, you know? Yeah. Well, what's the, what's the story? What are the, some of the stories on it? What kind of things are you exploring? Uh, I mean, just like I, I think most of our albums, hmm. uh, and especially the later you kind of come in, in, in our career, the more you kind of tend to to uh, talk about similar stuff. And, and I would say a lot of it is, is social commentary basic on what's going on around us. But, but for it to really match with the music, it's a lot of metaphors used and stuff like that. So you kind of, you, you try to um, make the language a little more, uh, I don't know, eloquent or exuberant or you, you kind of it's kind of a exaggeration of, of using the language so in that sense it's you try to make it a little bit poetic in mm. a sense and also like as far as uh, like rhymes that, that aren't necessarily rhymes and stuff like that but you have a tendency to 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 kind of go back to to similar things and it it's also uh it comes down to the vocalist and, and any vocalist knows that you can't hold a strong scream on the letter i like <laughs> so you have to have your mouth open so that's why a lot of bands you hear like when in metal you hear like ice and stuff like that that's easy for a singer to kind of sing like when your mouth is allowed to be open so there, there's stuff like that too that that kind yeah. of with the years you kind of tend to to go back to similar things as far as that goes but I mean, it's not only social commentary. I, I can't say that. I mean, uh, you have the, the Abysmal Eye that we released as a video. That's basically, I guess you can figure that out from the video, but that's kind of the big AI scare, right? So that's kind of a little more like Terminator, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit more like the the hazard of, of things that, mm. that could possibly come come to uh, fruition or not but then you have like uh broken cog which is the first track of the album that's more about like accepting your own you know the fact that you're we're all, we're all mortal and we we all have this baggage and it's as you get older sometimes it, it gets heavier and heavier and 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 it gets more and more real that that the the temporal nature of us is it gets a little more uh, a little more real and 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 the lyrics it's basically about realizing that and and still saying like fuck it and try to kind of go out as 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 good as you can and kind of just deal with it and say fuck mm -hmm. it you know and and then uh, one of Morton's uh, the broken cog that I just mentioned that's one of Morton's lyrics um, he wrote three of the lyrics for the new album uh, cool and. Uh, the, he has another one called "Light the Shortening Fuse." That's the second song that's out now, um, and that's uh, very much a social commentary on what social media has become, and and kind of uh, how it's become a tool for idiocy, basically, and 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 even a tool for disinformation, a political tool, and mm -hmm. and also for like for youth today, like for young girls and young boys, like it, it's it's. If you did, if you go too far in there, it's gonna it's gonna maybe present a very skewed you know vision of the world and and of people, and and uh, and also as far as like people that should have never, no one should ever listen to. Uh, we saw this especially like maybe in the in the kind of alt right and and in U.S. Um, mm. like the 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 Trumpsters and and. Uh, uh, maybe to an equal degree on the on the far left i don't know uh but but how we certain people should not ever be heard and <laughs> yeah. some of those some of those had the biggest megaphone all of a sudden through this so so that that uh light the shortening fuse is kind of a you know kind of talking about that mm -hmm. like that whole debacle i mean obviously evolution is what it is and 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 social media there's good things about it obviously as well mm. but it's a very it's a slippery slope you know it's like ai like they're both kind of dangerous they yeah they obviously yeah. have some practical wonderful applications and they could 
solve yeah, a lot exactly. of problems, but um, it's like the paradox of every the paradox of everything, you know? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the implications are kind of bleak and pretty severe if it goes completely the wrong way. So to speak. yes, and yeah. humans are fallible and flawed and uh, oh, the, yeah. death drives. Oh, yeah. the death yeah. drives yeah you know? like that Jungian that's thing that's yeah 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 it's a dangerous world it is I mean yeah. just look at what's happening in, in in Europe right now with Ukraine and Russia and it's, it's a nightmare man and uh but I mean lyrically if you want there's it's some other things yeah. like there's yeah. a song called Phantoms on there that's one of my lyrics that's more about kind of a little more personal uh things you've said things you've done throughout your life that you that that you have regrets about and I think with age and I feel like with age I became or is still becoming more empathic in a sense and you mm -hmm. tend to the things that I didn't really I you just brush off when you're 25 30 uh, they they're still like there and like gnawing at you and and so phantoms is basically saying those memories and and those regrets are like are like uh, like uh, you know yeah scepters or 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 yeah, you know or specters i mean not scepters yeah. that's something else <laughs> <laughs> specters or ghosts and or yeah. phantoms that that kind of you know haunt you keep haunting you you know through life so that's mm -hmm. kind of so so i mean lyrically you know it's it's a little bit all, all over the place but there's definitely a, if anything it, it, the social commentary side is mm. maybe a little bit more than, than other things you know yeah well it's the it's the right time for it i mean it's been it's been a time for us all to look at ourselves and look hard like how how have you guys how has this experience changed you the whole um the last two years like uh it definitely like the last two years or maybe a little more than that mm. um uh, my wife is is american so the whole th what from when trump got elected it, like it took on like life took on a little slightly different form even for me being a Swedish because I was very concerned about like her state of mind and stuff like that so mm. uh, um, so for a few years if anything I feel like the, the last like four years or so to especially the last two years of course with with COVID and everything put like 10 years in all of us you know it's just like <laughs> yeah. oh. It's like it, it made a dent, you know, but but maybe it's not quite that bad. But it's definitely been a been a, a few uh, kind of heavy years for mm. for uh, the world, you know, as such, no doubt. I'm for thought for thought provoking music. It's it's important. It's good to, you know. Yeah, I, and it's impossible to to like not kind of at least you know as a lyricist, it's like the easiest go to place in a sense mm. because there's so much like to be kind of you know scraped out of there and just put into words you know mm. so so obviously it, it's 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 a go-to place yeah yeah were you a big reader as a kid like when did you start writing lyrics and writing stories and stuff like that I didn't really start writing lyrics till I till I kind of joined the band yeah uh, but, but I did start reading books in English at like maybe around like 15 16 years old and then I kind of slowly kind of started appreciating uh, the original language more and most of the 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 authors that I it was mostly horror like you know Clive Barker and Stephen King and, yeah. and Dean Koontz and stuff like that so so I I just kind of liked it better it was just like a more expressive language to me than how I see Swedish is uh, th there's so many more ways to express the same thing in the English language than it is in the Swedish language so mm. So, so that that kind of took a hold on me, I guess. So, and that helped me obviously to to kind of understand and and become a lyricist in the first mm. place. But like I said, the first few the first few steps of me trying to write lyrics is not necessarily the grammar wise right even or 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 yeah, it's it's weird. Let's not. You don't need rules. That. You got you don't need rules. <laughs> no, I yeah. The, the, you guys are the heavy artist, metal band. Artist you know? choice. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. You're, an, you're yeah. an avant garde band. You can you can do some crazy things. It's funny. Um, uh, yeah. Misha, for, uh, we um spoke to Misha from Periphery a couple of weeks ago and um asked him what. Actually, I'd like to ask you too. What was the first music that you heard that you had a strong reaction to that wasn't love? And he's like, 
it was my sugar. It was my sugar. I, I didn't understand it. It was too much. I was overwhelmed. I was like, I don't get this. I don't understand it. And then it flipped. And I was like, I love this. I need this. This is a part of my life. So it, it's interesting what, how, how we absorb, like, what about you? What, what was something that you, the, the first, like that you had a strong reaction to you're like, I can't, I can't do this. Yeah. I mean, obviously growing up, I, I'm born in 71. So uh, first, the kind of the British wave, there was some bands, obviously Black Sabbath and 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 uh, and a bunch of bands in there, you know, like Saxon is another like early band that I listened to Iron Maiden, obviously, and those lyrics were not always like that positive, it kind yeah. of started getting a little dark in the in, in the during that kind of British wave and in and, and those bands. Mm. Um, but then obviously, then came like Kill Em All, 1983. And then that kind of definitely, okay, aggression, like real aggression. Because yeah. I mean, bands might have had like aggressive, you know, riffs or whatever, but it was maybe not, it was never like taken to that kind of extreme where the lyrics are also like very like kind of, ah, like that so 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 that would that would have been kind of I think uh, the, the, kind of the starting point and it was a starting point to so much like the whole Bay Area kind of thrash and 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 also East Coast like Anthrax and stuff like that and you know Testament and Slayer and all those bands and yeah and 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 that of course that kind of once that kind of hit there 83 to 85 uh, then it was like by a British wave band <laughs> kind of um not that i don't still love those bands obviously you know um and, and dio and and dio with black sabbath was like for me i like that i always like that more than ozzy mm. for some odd reason i mean i do appreciate early black sabbath for sure but by the time i kind of started listening to black sabbath it was like uh, live evil and stuff like and, and that was like Dio obviously and very dark like very like the lyrics and everything it's almost like that's the first kind of time that I felt like ooh, this is <laughs> this is uh, dark this is dark yeah my mom would not want me to listen to this I grew up in a, in a religious home you know with with religious yeah. with Christian parents so yeah uh, uh, to me that was really like oh and and uh, that kind of like really drew me in and and just as just in the same way as like uh horror movies and that whole like that genre was like me and Mota and the guitars we grew up together and that's like all we ever watched was like horror 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 always and we liked we both read like horror novels and horror authors and and so this like what what Black Sabbath with Dio did to me was like that he brought kind of something that sounded darker in there and yeah and, and uh, so so yeah there you he's, go he's I, pretty I digress he's pretty special yeah. like I I saw him live once and he's a tiny man a pocket rocket he was a yeah a, a with force. the biggest voice yeah, yeah like with the hugest na- voice in the world nature, absolutely yeah. yeah. It's it's beautiful, like this whole kind of thing spread around the world. How did you just find it in record stores? Were you involved in the tape trading scene or like zines? And like, how how did you guys get involved? Yeah, I mean, I I th- mostly I mean we were a group of friends and everyone. That's what we all did. We mm. all listened to vinyls and everyone was buying vinyls. And uh, most of those friends of mine, when I grew up, Morton, for example, so we had a few other friends and most of them definitely bought more albums than I, than I was allowed to buy. And, and like I said, if, before I had my own money, like I couldn't come up with a Black Sabbath album to my mom and say, you know, or, or, you know, something like that and, and ask her for money for it. Cause she would be like, ah, <laughs> of course not. No, you're not having that so it was a lot of like listening at my friends and also like like uh, loaning you know kind of loaning each other's um albums and stuff and kind of back and forth and, and and it was a lot of that you know hmm. but a lot of most of the time i mean for me my teens i was pretty much sitting in morton's room me and this other friend of us and 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 just listening to metal and yeah. and you know hard rock and metal that's that's kind of that's at least that's how i remember those years you know yeah yeah drums what about drums how did you find drums when did you like yeah i mean yeah i mean i 
it started it, it that, that started in church first really um, yeah uh, we don't have like uh, you know like american like gospel choirs where the drummers get to like really hit so this was the meekest softest playing drummer and all the like the old geezers at the church they even that was like borderline too loud for them you know when he's like playing with the choir but i was uh I was still fascinated by it at an early age. I mean, already at like three, four years old, I got all like wide, wide eyed when I saw a drum kit. So it was more the kit itself. Like it was something like almost oddly magical about it, you know? And, and so, so that's kind of where it started. And that, that's also kind of where I, where I started playing a little bit was like very, also very quietly, like playing at, with this like a side click and not like hitting the snare like side click and a little ride play and maybe a, a couple tom hits here and there with the like the church choir so that's kind of how it started and 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 but then obviously with the music i was listening to and and i was more or less demanding my parents like get me a real kit and and it kind of took off from there and we me and morton started at like 12 13 years old we started kind of trying to play other people's like music or, or some some simpler you know yeah. uh, songs and we would kind of try to do covers of that but we always just ended up playing like our favorite part of a song for like a minute and then we would just oh let's play that part from that song and then we would play like a little part from another song and so so it wasn't it wasn't until like maybe 14 around that age that I that I where when metal was like i i gotta have it, like a double bass pedal you know and after a lot of nagging i i finally got one like the first model double pedal that came out by pearl that was really weird to play on because the one beater would was looking like this to kind of hit the head yeah it was it was all whack. the whole experience but, but that's yeah so that's kind of how it started and trying to play like along with with some metallica stuff early metallica and, and like anthrax stuff and and, and stuff like that and 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 uh, slowly but surely we just kind of had this band all of a sudden me and Morton and that that we called Barophobia and we started kind of kind of doing uh, writing our own music at at around that age like fourteen years old fourteen yeah. fifteen cool and, and I was in that we were together in that band up until I joined uh, Mashuga in nineteen ninety and then he joined Mashuga a couple of years later yeah. Yeah, so you've got a bond. Oh yeah, we. I mean, yeah. we met it when we were at kindergarten when we were six years old, and we've yeah. kind of been, you know, like this ever, ever since. So he, he's definitely like a brother, you know. Yeah, well, that's a beautiful thing to have in um yeah. in a in a band brotherhood, if you will. Um, exactly. What, yeah, what do you bond over the most deeply, you two? Um, still horror movies <laughs> and and stuff like that but also i mean our take on on like kind of if we if we talk about like what how we feel about like the situation what, what the stuff that we see around us and mm. and what's kind of going on in the world we we usually have pretty similar thoughts and ideas about that kind of stuff yeah. but 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 that's it's not like something that we sit down and discuss all the time. No. It, it's obviously not that that kind of comes out in our lyrics once every five years. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 that's, and, and, but yeah, still movies a lot to, to yeah. a great, to a great degree. And, and sometimes a little bit over authors, you know, yeah, uh, and stuff like that, but it's uh, um, like, not necessarily horror author. It could be someone like Robert Anton Wilson or or uh, something that's kind of completely sidetracked from 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 you know the horror that that we tend to. But when he comes here, uh, this studio is in Stockholm. So I'm at, I'm at kind of the headquarters right now where we've been for 20 years. And Morten lives up north. He moved back to the city where we grew up. Uh, he, he moved back there like 12, 14, 15 years ago uh, when he uh, met his um, then wife, who also happens to be my cousin, my first cousin. Awesome. And they had a kid. Yeah. So we were even more family now. Yes. So, so, yeah. So his kid is, is also like his, his blood related to me because uh, of that. So awesome. 
anyways, he moved up there. So nowadays, when when uh, periods of time when he obviously needs to be here, if we're rehearsing or whatever we're doing, he comes down here. He takes the train or drives. It's like a six hour drive by car. Third. And and he hangs out here. And whenever he does that, we usually hang out here a lot in the evenings too. And our go to thing is watching horror movies. That's yes. like uh, we love it. You know, well, it makes sense. I, I mean, you, yeah. Your music is yeah, super dramatic really... and dark and scary, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and and also, like, not necessarily horror, but in movies, I think uh, uh, Morton especially, I mean, he has been very influenced, I would say, in his life uh, by by scoring and, and by, um, like, even orchestral stuff, whether that be for 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 alien or if it's for like a drama movie or something else it, mm. it, it doesn't really matter but i think that for him that has had a, a, a huge impact and he he doesn't only write uh, music that is meant for the band he has like too much uh, going on in there so he also writes all sorts of different music and some some of it is actually very more like scoring like like a more orchestral in a sense so mm. so that that's another thing that 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 the movies and the movie world kind of gave to us and hmm. and i i think that we all see our music and we have a visual sense of our music and that's why the lyrics and how they match had have to match and and we we, we get like the the every song is kind of a vision of something um, hmm. um and you kind of tend to see things not necessarily the same things we see for the same song but but there's definitely kind of a visual aspect to it as well. Mm, you know? Yeah. Well, I think it's it's important and I think it it conjures visuals in the listener as well. Like it's not just to make it like that. It has a, it has a, it feels, you can kind of, yeah, you can kind of sense a visual world. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, that's what we're hoping. Mm. obviously it's not always going to translate, you know, but, but I think maybe a little more, even now on the new album, there's, um, there's a little more like kind of where you feel like there's orchestral sense to like melodies that are kind of harmonies and stuff that we put on top of things. And, and maybe it's even a little more um, suggestive, if you will, in that sense than, yeah. than, than previous albums. But yeah, that's cool. I'm excited to hear it. It's good to, it's good. It's always good to when you guys re return with a, with a thing. Yeah. I, I mean, we feel, yeah, we feel pretty good about it. You know, yeah. We, Awesome. What um what was the local scene like in Sweden, like the music scene and stuff? Like, and how, yeah, like, you know, you're affected by these sort of bigger movements in the world, but what was going on closer to home? Or was it really just an extension of those, like the Bay Area and, and all of that? Like, does Sweden have its own sound or, yeah, like, was there I a local I think there's sense? definitely, yeah, I think there's, there's something to be said about that. And, and, I wouldn't say Sweden has a sound as such, but there was definitely, uh, you definitely do have a Gothenburg sound. There's no doubt yeah. about that. And and with 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 uh, bands like Entombed and Unleashed and stuff like that, you also do have a Stockholm sound and and uh, um, dismembered and bands like that. So so I, I definitely I, to a certain degree, I think it had to do with the studio and really? kind of the people that worked there because that kind of shape maybe sometimes a certain sound uh so to some degree that and to for i don't know what other the reasons that would really be but there's definitely a gothenburg sound and a stockholm sound mm. uh if, where the where meshuga is from umio i mean maybe even is probably more famous for hardcore and and bands like refuse and Abinanda and such and mm. If anything, I think that that shaped Meshuga to a certain degree too, because back then we're talking like early '90s, the uh, a lot of the shows would be a mix, like it would be metal bands and hardcore bands, uh, and to a certain degree, a little bit of competition, you know, for for us, like the band that kind of was always kind of growing at, at the same rate that we were uh, was refused. Yeah. So early years there it was not you know we were the best of friends so it wasn't like any kind of like hatred or anything we we loved them their band but but it there was still like metal and hardcore and and uh and to a certain degree i think that 
that is still something that that is still there to a certain degree in our music as well. I mean, our uh, Jens as a singer, he's more a, a hardcore singer than he is anything else. Hmm. Basically, it's like not really tonal. You don't really consider that too much. It's more just full on like blaring, you know. <laughs> so, so you definitely kind of have that from from the hardcore uh, side of things. And then early '90s, of course, where when grunge just kind of took over everything, you still had some bands that were still like making a lot of kind of headway, like Pantera. So you had kind of that whole oh, they're aggressive, they, oh, it's so brutal. So you had like the mix of what we grew up with, the prog, the the the, the British wave, the the Bay Area, and then like bands like Pantera, and you have the hardcore and also like fusion jazz and stuff like that that we listened to some on the side too. So it was like a big mishmash that just kind of made us want to take this kind of lateral, you know, move as far as mm. uh, compared to like, if there's such a thing as standard metal or like, you know, more normal metal or whatever, <laughs> like more straightforward. We always wanted to kind of do something that, that kind of took off to the side from that, you know. I like lateral move as an explanation for my sugar. It is a it is a lateral move. It's not yeah yeah. It's not, it's not forward. It's um. I, I yeah. think so. It's a little. It's a trying to do something a little different. And and over over the course of time, obviously, we get we get better and better at kind of expressing what that idea is. Hmm. Uh, whereas early and especially like the first couple albums and whatever, it's very kind of all over the place, and it's just like twenty five riffs in one song. Like why? <laughs> and, and of course, as, as you, it's silly, but as of course, you mature as a writer, you mature as a person, and you start kind of over time, you start writing a little more for the song and not to impress, you know, yeah. or try to like show, oh, look what we can do, look what I can do, look what I can do. Oh, here yeah. comes the next part, look what I can do, kind of. Uh, even though we weren't thinking necessarily like that, that's kind of how it comes across. And when I listen back mm -hmm. at it, it's like, what? What are we what are we trying to do here but it's at the same time it's fun to to go back and listen to it sometimes because it's just like so obvious that it's those overly excited full of testosterone kids that just like ah, just want to go you know so yeah it's, drums are such a physical instrument as well like do you think it's a different experience when you're doing these kind of quite different things than if you were doing kind of straight metal like i don't i don't know yeah. if that's yeah, I think it is. I, I wouldn't say that that would make it more physical at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, for it's it's the the like aspect of the physical aspect of playing drums is, is so much to do with what type of drummer you are. I I used to play way harder when I was like 25 years old, but I still play with with a fair amount of force and I can't like tone it down. So I wish that I could be a more uh, efficient you know, player, if you will, because yeah. it, I, I see like kids now, especially like the bar is like somewhere else completely now compared to when we were young and that there's so many kids around there are just like, what the hell? And it took like a day, literally after uh, our song from the new album, Abysmal Eye, before you had a bunch of kids that already played the whole thing through on guitar and on drums and everything, which is like no. just plain ridiculous you know yeah uh, so so there's a constant obviously a constant evolution in, in in musicianship and understanding of music because the music keeps like pushing the bar so the listener keeps pushing their bar and the understanding keeps you know so it's like a it's always gonna just go, kind of keep going that way i guess but yeah but you, I, I watched like one of those videos where this this guy like maybe 16 years old was like playing the whole song but he's it's so effortless for him because he doesn't use like any, there's no like oomph. And I grew up with, you know, like Cozy Powell and, and Vinny Appis and, and drummers like that. It's like, it has to be that, it has to be like force behind it. And there has to be physics. Like I can watch a drummer at a festival. If, the, he, if he doesn't have like, if there's no physics, like real, like you can feel it, you know, that, then I'm not interested in it. I don't care if you can do eights around uh, anyone you know everyone yeah. as far as on a technical level because uh, those are two very different things like technicality versus like just having that you know some something that that's kind of hard to describe and it's not necessarily 
about like how hard you can raise your arm before you hit the snare. A lot of times it's it's about something more than that. And and I would a good example for me is Gene Hoagland and and uh, and Dave Lombardo. Yeah, uh, they both play with a lot of oomph, but it's not necessarily like that they're you know trying to crush the kit. It's just mm -hmm. like they have a very kind of perfect refined technique that lets them play amply hard uh, and with a lot of like if you feel the energy if you're close to them when they play it's like oh it's palpable for sure and yeah so so there's something to be said about that and i i'm one of those drummers i can't i, I tried to tone it down because i kind of had to for like just for to keep my body being able to do this for a, a few more years i can't like just go nuts but i I that where I've kind of gotten now I play softer but it's still like with a lot of effort so yeah so that makes our music for me it's very physically demanding to play mm. um, to for someone else to perform it in the sense that the the hits are there in the right place uh might be something completely different and and this kid that I saw he didn't even break his sweat you know obviously <laughs> it's um, not so not metal man so, yeah, to me, I mean, I'm old school like that. So to yeah. me, metal and, and hard rock was also, that was uh, a, a equally crucial aspect of it. And why we fell in love with it was the kind of, ah, uh, that yeah. kind of aggression that, you know, you could see guitar players, they weren't like, <laughs> they were like attacking the strings and drummers were like really leaning into it, you know? Yeah. So so yeah. that's where, where I grew up and that's kind of where I've been ever since, you know, as a drummer. And I and mm. I, I, I can't seem to do much about it. You know? Well, you can't you can't fight the way you are as a creative person. Like you can't like there's just you just do things the way you do things. And yeah. Okay, I'm curious. Yeah. What are some like younger drummers that you think are kind of holding the holding the flag, holding the the torch? who are in the tradition of, you know, you know, your approach, Dave Lombardo, Gene Hoagland, all those kind of, like, who do you think's like killing it as with that? Uh, I'm actually the wrong person to ask because I have so, my, my check on what, what's going on right on. now as far as metal, I have absolutely no idea. Like this band takes up my effort and my time and I don't yeah. really, I don't go out listening or searching for, for yeah. Uh, for, for drummers or young young yeah. drummers like that but obviously you know the the ones that for me kind of have stood out that I've seen in the last like decade or so are are maybe not that necessarily that much younger than me yeah but maybe like 10 years 10 years younger than me there's a there's a drummer here in Stockholm that plays with a band called CB Murdoch and and that guy is like whoa off the charts he awesome. that, that guy can do anything and and very aggressive but but not maybe my style yeah. of drumming he's he's way more fast <laughs> that guy can go fast i cannot go fast that's that's not happening anymore <laughs> so there, and obviously you have guys like where you kind of have the mix of a metal drummer and and kind of a, a jazz or, or a fusion drummer uh with like the guy that i forget his name now which feels awful uh matt garska of of animals as leaders where you have a, a, a tremendous drummer that is kind of with one foot in metal in a sense because the band kind of has one foot in metal so he's he's something of a in between i think to like people maybe saw me in the early years because we were doing all this kind of tricky stuff and kind of a little influenced by some fusion drummers and stuff like that and so so i think maybe that's what he's doing now you know kind of um in the same sense it's just on a very much higher level you know? yeah it's beautiful what's what's happening out there do you think you can have a good metal band with a shitty drummer i don't think you can absolutely not no that you is, can't. No, hey. that's impossible impossible it's not it's not going to happen <laughs> i mean uh, I would say it's very hard to do to do it with shitty guitarists or shitty anything, but yeah. but yes, the drummer is it is the loudest instrument and kind of what kind of sets the tone and the pace and the 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 oomph of the band. And if it's it doesn't work, no, it it's doesn't not work. a thing. Like it, actually, it's very not much music at all that works if you don't have like a solid drummer that it's the good choice for what you're trying to do. You know. Yeah. What do you listen to to cheer yourself up? 
uh, once a year, happy birthday to you. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I don't. I mean, really... are you, I don't know if you're a dark person who needs cheering up but to, to feel good. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I um, really, it's kind of weird because at this point in time, where I, when and where I listen to music is in my car. Yeah. And uh, in there, it's, I'm old school. I have a, like one of those like CD changers in my car. I'm not even going like modern with like a USB sticker or yeah. stuff like that. I'm playing CDs. And I have like a stack of, of CDs like under the seat and and it's old school stuff, man. I, yeah. I tend to go back and kind of, I, I, it's like old, you know, old Rush, Pink Floyd, you know, Marillion, Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, Dio, you know, that kind of stuff. Sometimes I'll like put on like Mastodon or something like that. And yeah, but, but, but more or less, most of it is actually like old stuff that I, that I, that it's just reciting in here and if i if i want to listen to something that's kind of my go-to place i tend to just keep going back there you know well you wrote you grew up in a pretty golden age of rock and roll like you grew up at the right time like you did like that that's a pretty cool era to be absorbed in like you know childhood through to yeah years. absolutely and then being yeah. a part of a movement in the 90s and stuff like you know it's yeah. pretty pretty cool it's pretty cool to be absorbed this- yeah yeah, in this point in time as well, I mean, when we were, obviously, when you're a hard rocker or metal and you're 15 years old, it's not cool to listen to, to like, you know, the synth stuff of the 80s. <laughs> yeah, right? did you have a secret you're like, new wave? You're like, you're like enemies, like, yeah. or not really, but you kind of jokingly, you're kind of, ah, you know, you're, you're stupid, you're so cheesy, I can listen to that shit. And, and, uh, and but then as you grow older, and especially for me, maybe in the last 10 years or so, I really appreciate like so much of, of what was going on in the 80s. Yeah. Like be that be that Duran Duran or Tears for Fears or 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 uh, you know, you erasure, you name it, like mm. uh erasure. Yeah, right. Mm, I think it's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Like that 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 was kind of the hit music of of that time, mm. which I just hated or i made myself think that i hated it back in the back in the day but maybe when i was having a shower you know uh, yeah. maybe i was like humming on something that wasn't necessarily metal yeah if you will so but but that's another thing that, that it was a golden age not just for for hard rock and, and metal but it was a golden age for for a lot of music in mm. the 70s and 80s and of course the 60s too but mm. we kind of missed that and uh, yeah and to a certain degree and and kind of realize that at a, at a later stage you know like like later 60s and uh, you know bands like cream and stuff like that 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 yeah. kind of uh that i f- find very intriguing now and i really like the kind of the sounds and what they were what they're doing and, and i mean we get older and we start appreciating different things and and what you rejected as a as a teen because it's too cheesy or it's too late. I don't know. That's lame, man. Yeah. That is yeah. Uh, not necessarily how you feel about those things now. And it's, yeah. It's interesting how many heavy bands are kind of going down that path of like exploring stuff like Greg from um, Dillinger and his like Black Queen project and stuff like that. There's a few of the bands, yeah, people in heavier bands that are doing sort of stuff that very much feels reference, referencing that 80s synthy kind of stuff, which is kind yeah. of. I like hearing yeah, different yeah. stuff. Would you, yeah, I, what um, what do you and your wife bond over? I know she grew up in like New, New York hardcore um, and like Jessica Pimentel and yeah, like what, what do you guys bond over? And would you ever make something of, together? Uh, actually, we've been meaning to, but I'm yeah. the, I'm the, I'm the, like the, the one that's in the way for that. He, yeah. he wants to. <laughs> And she was like, hey, "Come on, puppy, let's let's do something. Let's let's record something." And uh, and I was, I'm always like, "Ah, uh, I've I've just spent like six hours at Cubase at the studio. I don't want it. I don't want to do that anymore. You know." So I'm kind of I I'm a procrastinator of a new different level. You know, I I yeah. I can't with a band because obviously that then I it's have absurd. to. You know, but yeah. with anything that's kind of self. Uh, choice then then yeah it's it's a it's a slow it's, it's a slow, burn. slow thing yeah but but i'm still hoping that we will at some point but yeah 
I mean, she, we, we do bond over music uh, and that like, that could be Juanes or it can be like, uh, like uh, Roy Ksop with with Robin or you know yeah. uh, stuff like that. It's more like usually electronica or something that's not metal. Uh, yeah. Her taste in metal is way hey, more brutal than mine. She's like, <laughs> ah, she wants that. She loves like black metal and stuff like that. And 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 she even ha had a show for a while that I don't know. If, I think she's coming back to do some more of that. But on on <laughs> give me a radio, uh, give it metal that that she did like weekly or bi-weekly um uh, and and she she knows i mean as far as she's so, so much more knowledgeable about not only what's kind of going on with what kind of bands are coming up right now mm -hmm. and, and kind of death and black metal but also just overall like she she knows so much more than than i i uh that I, I ever will. So, so she's, she's the metal head of the two yeah. of us for sure. Yeah. But still, we don't, still, we, when we're together, we mostly, do, we mostly don't listen to that much metal. I think just because she knows that I, like, if she starts playing stuff that's over 180 BPM, so I'm like, ah, Settle down. On, it's too fast. It's too fast. That's it's too hard. fast. For her, it's like, man, you're old. This is slow. Like, get, a, get, a, get a grip, daddy. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so two final questions. Um, five songs that change your life and your musical Mount Rushmore, the face is carved in the stone. That second question, I don't even know what to make of that. Let's yeah. start with the first one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then you have uh, Punch and Judy with Marillion, uh, uh, Tom Sawyer with Rush. Uh, I will say uh, Schism by Tool. Dude. Uh, which is way later, obviously. Yeah, I just jumped like like three decades ahead of, <laughs> or two decades. But that, yeah, that album, Lateralis, like did a thing. It did a number on me. I was so into that. So, yeah. Uh, um, um, uh, hold on. My brain. Uh, it's a lot it just, to ask. It yeah. just farted. Yeah. It, it farted itself to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, but I mean, Black Sabbath, but like yeah. heaven and let's say heaven and hell. Like I, I always loved it with Dio um, mm. more more than maybe I ever did or will with with Ozzy. Uh, and then I would say uh, uh, I will say Tommy the Cat with Primus. Because that's another band that I loved. In early, early years of Meshuggah, I listened to so much Primus, especially that album, the Sailing the Seas of Cheese. Yeah. And and uh, the the album after um, Pork Soda. Yeah. And I just that uh, um, Tim Harb Alexander was the drummer, and and he he also put it like as far as like who I am as a drummer. I don't think I would have been exactly this drummer if it wasn't for him because he also had like a really cool tasteful way of and he played some double bass and stuff and he was really cool drummer so yeah awesome yeah okay and so, the second yeah. question there what was that okay what do you mean by so that? if you had to pick like four faces like the people who had the most impact on you that we like put on a like you know how it's the four presidents or whatever this is like the four presidents of your musical taste like without these four figures um, you wouldn't be who you are. That's kind of a big, I'm making it sound yeah. really big. No, well, you have obviously, we already mentioned, so Neil Peart goes up there, obviously. obviously. With his hat. I would, yeah, I, I would say, uh, I would say James Hetfield goes on there because um, it doesn't have to be necessarily a drummer to have a huge impact on you, like as far as like the songwriting and, and the style of things. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, I would say Fish. Wow. In early years, the, the singer of Marillion back in the day. Yep. Because uh, he did intrigue me a lot with his lyric, lyrics and, and just, it was a huge, it was just a huge thing for me. And, and, uh, and uh, um, yeah, oh I know this it's, is, yeah. It, that's weird that they, why would this be hard at all? Like, mm -hmm. this shouldn't be hard. Like, I should see this. 
I should see this like Mount Rushmore every night when I go to sleep, right? Yeah, I want to. So. I want to carve them. Like I know it's probably like yeah. environment. No, I, I will, sound. I'm gonna. Yeah, Dio. Dio's face goes up there too. Yeah. that's yeah. that's just how it is. He's but yeah. it's you know you can't you can't have heavy metal without Dio. Yeah, know? and together with Dio, obviously you can't have Dio without Vinny Appis. So yeah. there you have it. That's I mean, five phases. That's five phases right there. Yeah, Vinny that can Appis. Be intertwined. On, yeah, that. that that's what's going yeah. on. That's what's real. Yeah. That's, cool. That's what's real. That's what's real. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. No, Thomas. my pleasure. Like, I'm really excited um, to hear new music. Um, this guy's this is a Revolver Fan First podcast. And Sugar have a new album out next week, which is exciting. And yeah, go forth and um, may your day be most triumphant. <laughs>